sorry now That I'm a little late I apologize That you had to wait It totally slipped my mind I lost all my sense of time So buy me that drink and just let me think And I'll tell you the reasons why Hello and welcome to another episode of Alibi the Podcast, an initiative started by Gagasan Mahasiswa Undang Udang Sabah, known as GANS for short. This is the very first episode of our special podcast series where we invite former members of the judiciary to share their experiences and life in the legal profession as well as the judiciary, starting from their time as a young lawyer till they made it to the very top. I'm your host, Elaine. Joining me today is Samuel and our very first special guest, Dato Ma Wang Kwai. Thank you very much, Elaine. Thank you, Samuel, for having me this evening. I was uh, quite happy to read what you had to say about guns. That's uh, Gagasan Mahasiswa Unda Unda uh, Sabah. And um, your acronym sounds very active and <laughs> sounds very lively. In your hands, I'm in your good hands. You can ask me. Uh, whatever questions you want to. Yes. Thank you okay. so much. All right. So to give our listeners and viewers some background, Datoma was appointed as a Judicial Commissioner of the High Court of Malaya and then as a Judge of the High Court of Malaya in Kuala Lumpur. Then he was elevated to the Court of Appeal in 2012 and retired from the judiciary in 2015. In 2016, Datoma was appointed as a Commissioner of the Malaysian Aviation Commission and presently, he is a legal consultant with Messrs. Ma Wen Kwai and Associates. So besides having served in the Judicial and Legal Services of Malaysia, he has also served as a Deputy Public Prosecutor and Senior Federal Counsel in the AG Chambers. And after leaving, he resumed practice as an advocate and solicitor in Ma Wen Kwai and Associates. So to kickstart uh, this interview, like uh, sort of like with all our other guests, we would just like to I'll start from you know the very beginning. Um, as a, all the way from the very start, Dr. Mark, could you just tell us about you know your uh, early childhood memories, uh, your favorite childhood memories? What do you may remember about them? Wow, that goes back a long way, and uh, they will also tell you my age. But um, <laughs> no worries. Well, what I can recall is that. Um, I come from a big family, being number 10, with many, many uh, uh, siblings and many people in the house. And um, I was living in a small wooden house in uh, Jalan Salon in Kuala Lumpur. And um, what I remember of childhood is that uh, there were no fences. Unlike today, all the houses, compounds of houses are fenced up with gates and so on. And I recall very fondly that there were no fences, no gates, and um, the neighbors uh, would just come in and out of the house. We had, I had Indian neighbors, Malay neighbors, and I would go in and out of their homes uh, with little any uh, difference. Uh, you know, nobody made a fuss about uh, who was who and who ate what and so on. Sadly, today, uh, people are so conscious of uh, uh, your background and your religious beliefs and what you eat and how you wear your clothes and so on. So I think um, I've seen a big difference from yesteryears from uh, from today uh, and today. Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, and as a, you know, as like a young child, as a kid, can you tell us what the, what are some of your hobbies? What, what do you like to do as part of your hobby? Yeah, and I think uh, talking about hobbies, well, um, like everybody else, uh, as a kid, you know, you rare fish, you go and catch spiders, you play with pop guns. Unfortunately, these are things unknown to the kids uh, these days. Um, when I talk to my grandkids and talk about uh, uh, playing with pop guns, they'll ask me, what pop guns? You know, <laughs> they are thinking of the big uh, plastic assault guns, probably. But these are little gadgets made from bamboos, all homemade, or catching spiders. Uh, to have uh, to make the spiders fight. This is all unheard of these days. 
Yeah, things have changed. Well, it's so nice to you know hear of your eventful childhood that I'm sure was very priceless. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Okay, so moving on, I'd like to progress into questions about your legal career and how it began. So first of all, I'm sure you know all of us would love to know why did you choose to go into the path of a legal profession? As I mentioned just now, I come from a very large family um, and uh, a very poor background. And um, I remember staying in a uh, small wooden house. The rental was 50 ringgit per month. And um, well, everybody crammed into this house. And I also recall that uh, the house was in poor condition because every time it rained, it would leak badly. So much so that I had this phobia of leaking roofs um, until today. You know, I can go to sleep and when I hear a heavy shower, I will still think that there's a, a leak in my roof. But um, what uh, really got me thinking was that, um, you know, here we have uh, the landlord or landlady uh, renting out a house, which was in such poor condition, yet no efforts or no attempt was made to repair the house. And yet uh, we were having to pay the rent. So uh, you know, I always thought there must be some fairness in all this. And little did I realize that there's a starting of um, landlord and tenancy uh, law. <laughs> landlord and tenants and, and uh, real property law. So uh, I suppose that's one of the trigger points. Mm. And on that, be before discovering the legal profession, was there any other pathway that you intended to take before deciding to pursue law? Was there like any other course that perhaps you like to do before doing law? Right, I was uh, studying in St. John's Institution, uh, a very good school in those days. It still is. Um, the school is located in Bukit Anas, Kuala Lumpur, not too far away from my house. And um, after Form 3, we had the uh, LCE, Lower Certificate of uh, Examinations. And uh, after the Form 3 results, we would then be streamed into the Arts or Science stream uh, in Form 4 and then progressively onto Form 5. So I was uh, streamed and went into the Arts uh, stream, Form 4, Form 5, and did the um, uh, what was known as, uh, at that time as a Senior Cambridge Examination. And um, really, in those days, if you're doing arts, you either end up oh, studying law or economics or commerce. You know, that's about it. Uh, the number of courses or type of courses is very, very limited. And of course, if you were in the science stream and the cleverer ones went to the science stream, the not so clever ones ended up in arts, like me. <laughs> and uh, in the science stream, of course, they went on to study uh, medicine, engineering, accountancy, and so on. So really, the opportunities were fairly limited. And um, I think my classmates either studied law or uh, did economics. You know, so I chose uh, to study law. Uh, and so uh, you said you studied law. Uh, where, do you, uh, where do you decide to go for your law school? And do you find it tough? Uh, yes, I did my uh, uh, HSC, Higher School Certificate here in Kuala Lumpur. I did my lower six. And uh, with um, the uh, results that I obtained, I got admitted into Lincoln's Inn, one of the four inns of court in uh, London. And in those days, and I'm talking about 1967, uh, one could start doing the, uh, the course at the inns, in other words, studying for the bar uh, course. Uh, without having to do a LLB, um, nor uh, having to have a basic law degree. Yeah. So um, as a uh, 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 holder of a HSC result, I got admitted to into um, the INS of Court, and the exams uh, were run by the CLE, the Council of Legal Education. As you may know, there are four INS of Court, uh, Lincoln's Inn, Grey's Inn, Inner Temple, and Middle Temple. Um, the inns, of course, are neither hotels nor the uh, temples, places of worship. They're just uh, names. 
and uh, but the exams were centralized and they were run by the CLE. It was a three-year course, and after that, um, you can uh, do the bar and get called to the, uh, or rather, you have to sit for the exams, the final exams, and uh, you will get called to the English bar. But of course, to practice in England, you would then have to do chambering uh, in England. If not, you have to come back and um, do the uh, uh, chambering. Um, when I came back, uh, uh, there was no CLP available at that time. So all the students who were there uh, went on to uh, do the bar and uh, got called to the English bar. Oh, that's that's very interesting. So obviously the next question is, um, you know, you came back to Malaysia. Where did you read in chambers? And tell us about a little bit about your pupillage experience. Sure. Um, I, did, I did the exams in, uh, in London and uh, after passing them and having kept my dinners, I um, was called to the English bar and I did um, three months of chambering with a, a QC who specialized uh, only in criminal uh, law. And I recall doing, um, well, as a chambering student, not much except to carry his books and follow him to the old baby uh, every day because <laughs> he was such a busy practitioner, he had hardly any time to uh, talk to the students. But um, having come back, um, I uh, uh, chambered for six months with Mrs. Uh, Shen Delamore and company. My master was the late uh, Mr. Ronnie Koo. I chambered six months and then was called to the uh, English bar. Chambering today, of course, as you know, is nine months yeah, in Malaysia. Uh, and do, do you like anything about, you know, the firm you worked in in Shun like in, during your pupilage? Well, I recall uh, we were all seated in a corner in the uh, office and at any one time there were about six or seven chambering students. So uh, we all got on very well and uh, learned from each other. Um, and um, although there were many lawyers in the firm, uh, really, we we never well. We did we did get work from some of the senior lawyers, but um, uh, you know, if um, we were to say that oh, we learned a lot from the master and a lot from the uh, lawyers, I think that will be a an overstatement because a lot more could have been done. And this is one has been one of the major complaints uh, of chamber even up to now. Young lawyers will uh, complain that say that uh, the masters really have no time to spend with the pupil and uh, to, to, to teach the pupils. But uh, having said that, I think it's also a lot to do with the pupils themselves, that um, if you're motivated enough to learn, you would actually, um, you know, ask, go around and ask the right questions and look for uh, interesting things to do in a firm, rather than wait to be told what to do. Uh, Dr. Ma, uh, as a lawyer, uh, were there any memorable cases or any issues that you dealt with while practicing? And, you know, if any, can you share some of them with us? I practiced at, uh, after my chambering and after my call. Uh, this was in 1972. Incidentally, this is my 50th year uh, after my call to the Malaysian bar. Um, this month, actually, next week, 21st of uh, July, uh, this year, I will be celebrating 50 years of my call to the Malaysian bar. So it's a, a very long time. And um, I think in the role of advocates and solicitors, my number is probably about um, 130 or even uh, lesser, because on the roles of the uh, advocates and solicitors kept at the bar council, it goes by the date of the call, of one's call to the bar. So, um, uh, and um, this is something which uh, um, you you get promoted, so to speak, because every time somebody ahead of you passes on, you go higher up the ladder. So this is one promotion that I don't look forward to. <laughs> it's because uh, you go up because somebody else has gone away. Now, the uh, thing, of course, is that, um, after my call to the bar, I practiced as a lawyer for a year. 
as a legal assistant uh, with a firm known as Mrs. Uh, Athena Harpen and Company. Um, that's when Athena Harpen was then the deputy chairman of the MIC way back. This goes way back to 1972. I had earlier applied to join the judicial and legal service. And by 1973, they, uh, they, they, they called me to uh, go for an uh, interview. And uh, I was, I did, and then I was um, taken in as an officer of the Judicial and Legal Service of uh, Malaysia. Now, the Judicial and Legal Service, as you may know, is a joint service, meaning to say judicial and legal, they both come under one common commission and uh, officers um, in the service are in the two branches are intertransferable, which means to say, if you are appointed as a magistrate, in the judicial service uh, today, uh, you can at any time be transferred and be appointed, say, a DPP in the legal service. Yeah, so it's intertransferable. And that is something which is uh, continuing until today. But um, we have been advocating that there should be a change and that these two services should be uh, independent, they should be separated, there should be a different head of the uh, legal service and a different head for the judicial service. Right now, the attorney general is head of the judicial uh, service and the chief registrar, yeah? but, but it is still one service. So um, um, I was not bonded, so I didn't have to repay any, you know, to, 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 uh, to work to uh, work off my bond. Um, but I, as a free scholar, I wanted to join the service to experience how the other half lives, so to speak, because the people that I was uh, mixing with were all practitioners, um, but uh, hardly knew anyone from the service. So I said uh, to myself, I would like to give myself five years to find out what life is like in the judicial and legal service. And, uh, well, lo and behold, I liked the, the work I was doing so much that it extended to 12 years. <laughs> and I only left uh, service in uh, 1985. So during those 12 years, I served as a magistrate, uh, president of the Sessions Court, um, registrar, senior assistant registrar of the High Court. And that was in the judicial uh, service. Then I was transferred to the legal service and I uh, served as a deputy public prosecutor, uh, senior federal counsel in the civil division. And then I was, uh, I, I went on a scholarship for my master's. And then on my return, I was uh, serving as a uh, senior assistant parliamentary draftsman in the drafting division. But that was a very short time before I decided to uh, leave service. Oh, wow. It seems that you have like a very illustrious uh, career so far in terms of being a lawyer, would you say? Well, I had the opportunity to uh, work in many different portfolios. And in answer to Elaine's question, whether there was any uh, interesting um, cases, well, as a legal assistant, um, you know, dealing mainly with civil uh, matters, you do a lot of run-of-the-mill cases, debt recovery, Motor claim, motor accident claims, and and so on. Nothing spectacular or nothing very uh, uh, earth shaking. But when I um, served as a DPP and prosecuted uh, cases, uh, th that was a very in challenging and interesting um, tenure. In that, um, as a DPP, I prosecuted many capital uh, offences uh, like murder. Um, ISA, ISA was, uh, uh, there were many, many ISA cases in the early 70s and uh, many other uh, cases that carried a death penalty, Firearms Increased Penalties Act and, and, and the uh, Kidnapping Act and so on. Um, yes, uh, and of course, not forgetting DDA, Dangerous Drugs Act. Those were the early days of Section 39B and uh, uh, drug trafficking was a big problem in the 70s. Um, and uh, you know, I still recall there were many cases that were uh, as a result of entrapment. Uh, people would come in from DEA, 
the Drug Enforcement Agency of the, of America um, pose as uh, Asian provocateurs, you know, and um, then they will set up traps and people get uh, uh, arrested and charged. So we did the uh, part where um, where where uh, they ended up in court. I recall there's one case uh, where, and probably at that time, it was one of the few cases where there were multiple people, multiple accused that were charged and convicted. I, I recall, if not mistaken, there were about five or six people uh, who were convicted and sentenced to death, one of whom was a woman. And she was reportedly the first woman drug trafficker to have been sentenced to death uh, in those days. Um, so yes, that's uh, a lot of uh, prosecutions and then um, as senior federal counsel, well, I was dealing a lot with uh, claims against the government uh, because um, the uh, uh, Attorney General's Chambers, our government, we are, you know, Attorney General Chambers are the lawyers for the government. So um, when it comes to claims against the government, uh, government, for example, government vehicles, police vehicles, army vehicles, they get involved in accidents. Uh, there are no insurance policies. They are not insured. Government is the insurer itself. So there were many times where we were dealing with cases like that, um, and, and, and um, um, you know, almost like acting for the insurance company when in fact it was the government. Um, yes, there are many uh, interesting cases. Uh, I remember one where it resulted in a claim. I think it was the, the late Mr. Kapal Singh acted for a family on the allegation of the mix-up of babies. Uh, in the Saramban uh, hospital. And uh, in those days, uh, there was no DNA to, to determine the parentage of the baby. And um, well, it took two years for the case to be uh, completed, during which time. And the baby remained in the nursery in the hospital, during which time, by the time the, the case was settled, um, the baby was already two years old. Mm. <laughs> and and what happened, I recall of that case quite clearly, is that there's really no, there was no mix-up, no physical mix-up of the babies, but there was a mistake in the entry of the names in the records, which gave the impression that the babies had been mixed up. That was a long time ago. But today, I'm sure if a case like that happens, no problem. The DNA will solve it very quickly. Wow. So, yeah, that's very interesting to see how much we have advanced, you know, from back then. Mm. Yeah. So, Dato Ma, with so much experience um, under your belt, do you prefer trial cases more over appellate cases? Oh, that's a very interesting question. I, uh, I like both. Uh, as a practitioner, I preferred court work. I was not one for conveyancing and... Uh, uh, or just uh, advising corporate matters, I found that too uh, um, desk bound. Uh, I wouldn't say it's not challenging. Um, it is. There's a lot of law involved in corporate work, commercial and company law and so on. Um, but um, that calls for a lot of uh, sitting down and writing opinions and so on. I prefer to be on my feet. I think I think better on my feet. And uh, so going to court for litigation, uh, was my uh, interest, whether civil or criminal cases, uh, as, so, as a practitioner in the early years. Then, of course, uh, same thing. Uh, when I was in service, judicial and legal service, I think I enjoyed my time as a prosecutor and as a uh, civil litigator more than the time when I was in the advisory division or um, or in the drafting division. In fact, I, I dislike the drafting division <laughs> because uh, all, you know, it's important, important work. You are drafting bills and so on, but it already meant crossing the T's and dotting the I's. And um, one has to be very patient for that kind of work. I, I don't have that patience. So, um, so I preferred um, court work. And uh, so if you ask whether I prefer trials or pallet work, are you asking me as a practitioner or as a judge? Uh, for now, uh, as a practitioner. Okay. Um, yeah, I already uh, explained to you that uh, uh, 
litigation is more interesting, more challenging. Um, but whether a trial, uh, in, uh, doing trials was more challenging than appeals, I think both have their challenges. Um, it's really very hard to compare and say, I prefer this or the other, uh, because it calls for different skills and different standards. When you are a practitioner uh, and you're doing a trial in court, um, you have to be very resourceful. And um, of course, if it's a criminal case, you really don't have much uh, uh, information uh, other than what uh, you have been briefed by your client. Uh, and then the rest of it is always what you hear, and probably for the first time, what you hear from witnesses as they are giving evidence in the criminal case. Uh, so the challenge there really was that um, you have to be uh, quick on your feet in cross-examination to, um, to, 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 to rebut what has been said and to challenge what has been said. So it called for a different uh, skill set um, to be able to... Um, get to points very quickly and to make a case out of it yeah in civil litigation is of course different because you have all the pleadings and all the cost papers you which you have prepared before the trial uh and and uh, a trial there will be more a civil trial will be more of a presentation of work already done in the office mm -hmm. whereas in criminal cases uh, a trial is your work is actually being done in court more in court than in the office. If you are, if you follow what I'm saying, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's on the one hand. That's in the trial court for uh, appellate work. Uh, yes, let's say you are appealing from the lower court to the uh, high court, um, or from the high court to the uh, court of appeal or federal court. Uh, as you know, everything is by way of the appeal records. Yeah. So uh, again, calls for different. Uh, set of skills, uh, you must be able to um, do a good, uh, uh, good drafting for your, of your grounds of appeal. Uh, you must make sure that um, all corners are covered so that uh, you will not be uh, told, oh, you did not raise this as a grounds and therefore you are preempted from raising it uh, in an appeal. So you, um, yeah, uh, um, preparing the grounds of appeal is very important. And, um, Yes, uh, I think research, you do a lot more research when you are doing appeal cases. Uh, but other than that, you go by the record. Uh, you, you are not dealing with uh, witnesses. Um, it's all there. It's, you know, uh, it depends very much on how well or how bad the trial uh, went. And you go by the record of what is stated. Uh, uh, Dr. Ma, could I ask, uh, in terms of like your life as a private practitioner. Um, right now, as you know, young, law young lawyers, pupils, there are so many choices to go. But, you know, during, can you give us a glimpse back in, in, your, in your time? Did you had a chance to specialize or do you just took whatever, what came to you? Well, um, yeah, good point, Samuel. You are talking about career opportunities. And uh, for a very long time, people always thought that, uh, oh, you studied law, you get an LB, uh, practice is the only course of uh, work. But really, that is one quarter or one of the four uh, main uh, things you can do. Practice is, by and large, the preferred uh, thing to do. But um, I would say that uh, fresh graduates should also pay some attention and think about a career in the judicial and legal service, which means to say you become a uh, government servant, yeah, judicial legal services, a uh, service uh, members are members of the civil service. They are government, government officers, government servants, and you're bound by general orders and so on. Unlike judges, judges of the superior courts, high court and above, uh, judges are not civil servants. Judges are independent and uh, they're governed by the um, judges, uh, as far as salary is concerned, the Judges Remuneration Act and the uh, Appointments Commission and so on. But um, uh, uh, in the judicial legal service, um, while the salaries may not be as, uh, as attractive as in practice, but uh, it will be good to do a stint um, in the service, uh, as what I did, to find out um, what life is like on the other side. You, know? you don't have to be there till you retire. Uh, 
five years, 10 years. So it'll be a very good uh, uh, thing to do. And if anyone is thinking about when to join the judicial legal service, my advice is that do it as soon as you can. That means join the service as early as you can um, because it's easier for you to join the service and say after five years or 10 years to leave service if you're so minded to uh, come out to practice. But if you have done 10 years of practice and you want to go into service, you're going to start from scratch. As 10 years a practitioner, you'll be earning ooh, quite a bit of uh, money and you're not going to get that kind of uh, money when in service. Yeah? So from a very practical point of view, it would be uh, to do service first, then think about uh, practice later. So there's a second uh, way of uh, as a career, uh, second uh, avenue as a career. The third will be to be an academic, become a tutor, become a lecturer, and um, teach. Now, nowadays, there are so many universities, both private and public, so the opportunities are much, much more. Um, before, there was only what, during my time, there was no law faculty in uh, MU. The only law faculty was in Singapore. Singapore University had a law faculty that admitted uh, Malaysian students, no doubt. And then the, the MU law faculty came about uh, later. But uh, today, there's so many colleges like you, uh, Elaine, you are in BAC, is one of the leading uh, local colleges. And uh, so if you end up as an academic, you can teach um, in any of these universities and colleges. The other and the fourth um, avenue would be to be an in-house counsel. Again, today the opportunities are very vast. In-house here can be a bank, a financial house, a bursa, uh, securities commission, any of these commissions, all of them, all of them are big setups with legal departments. Yeah, uh, even the big hospitals will have uh, legal departments. So you can always be an in-house advisor. You don't, of course, you don't go to court because you can't be working as a counsel, in-house counsel and uh, take a PC at the same time. You can't do that. You have to elect. If you want to take your PC, you can't be employed elsewhere. Yeah, it, you have to practice law. You can't be an in-house lawyer with a PC. So um, you have to make that decision. Uh, but uh, again, if you spend a few years, five years, 10 years, and you want to practice, very easy, very, uh, you can make a very smooth switch, a very smooth transition to uh, apply for your um, PC. But after in-house counsel, as an in-house counsel, you still have to do your chambering. Okay, so again, maybe it's better to do your chambering, get called, then become an in-house counsel. And then when you are done with that, you can just come out and apply for a PC. But if you are in the judicial and legal service, you don't have to do chambering to join the service. And uh, if not mistaken, after seven years of service, you get a total exemption from chambering. Yeah, so that's one of the uh, uh, advantages that you can make use of. But uh, as I mentioned just now, as a career opportunity, I think that by and large, those who have studied law, those who have done their bar, uh, and those who have all done the CLP and get called to the bar, um, by and large, will end up as uh, practitioners. And then again, you have to decide whether it is going to be a civil uh, practice or uh, a criminal practice, or, or, or go to a big firm and do a little of everything, or go to a small niche firm and specialize in a particular area. For example, if you are interested in, say, medical legal cases, uh, not every firm does that. There are some uh, uh, smaller firms that uh, specialize in this. So you might want to join some, some firm like that to, to, to gain the experience. Or if you want to do uh, just criminal practice, um, join the, some of the uh, firms that just do that. Kapal Singh and Company uh, does, does criminal uh, work. Yes, it's not easy to get in, but um, if you do, uh, you will enjoy your, your work, I'm sure. Yeah, it's so great to, you know, hear about the flexibility and how we can venture into so many other areas instead of going into the traditional way of being a lawyer straight after uh, finishing our PPH. But okay. having said that, you know, Elaine, I think um, uh, 
many people will also agree that uh, with a legal degree, a law degree, uh, many doors can be opened and you don't really have to do anything uh, related to law if you don't want to, simply because after three years of uh, study, doing the LLP and another year of practical training, you become a trained person. Your mind is trained to uh, look at things objectively, uh, to look at uh, issues with a very questioning mind. You don't just accept whatever is said uh, or whatever is dished out to you. Even your master, when the master gives you work and asks you to do X, Y, Z, uh, maybe you're not vocalized. You may not vocalize your thoughts, but most certainly uh, thoughts will be running in your head to see whether or not it's the right thing to do. Is your master asking you to do something illegal? And then you must <laughs> stand up and say, no, it's not right. And so on and so on. So you are a trained person. And uh, so that is very helpful uh, when you want to do any other kind of work. Even if you venture into business, you know, with a legal background, business will invariably involve uh, contracts. Um, it will involve uh, all kinds of agreements. And uh, if you have a knowledge of uh, civil procedure and if you have good in your contract law, sure, it's a big uh, bonus to start with. Yeah. Yeah, I actually do agree. I think that law school trains our critical thinking skills as well as our problem solving skills. Yes, and that's how we be become you know, the trained person like you mentioned. All yeah. right, so uh, moving on, I'd like to ask you about when you were at the DPP and the Senior Federal Council. So can you tell our listeners uh, what are the differences in being a prosecutor or a federal counsel as compared to a lawyer, a normal practitioner? Okay. Let me start as a prosecutor. And uh, so as a prosecutor, uh, uh, you have to prove a person uh, guilty beyond reasonable doubt. Okay, so you are uh, there as right in the front line. Uh, you, as a prosecutor, you will have to decide on the charges. And of course, if they're very important, uh, cases as a junior DPP, you will have to get the uh, agreement and consent of your senior DPPs or even of the attorney general uh, on the nature of the charges to be uh, framed. Uh, let's say all that has been settled uh, in the chambers and you're in court. And as a prosecutor, you will have to uh, uh, decide um, whom to call um, in a sequence that makes most sense and most chronologically uh, suitable to the court. Uh, in fact, a prosecutor is actually telling a story. So when you want to tell a story and the audience is the judge, uh, you want to tell it in a way which is systematic, uh, chronological order, and so it's easy to follow. You know, you always start, you know, when you were doing nursery, in nursery school, you'll uh, hear stories, it's always once upon a time, blah, 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 and then uh, happily ever after. So I suppose in prosecution, you always start with once upon a time and you call your PW1, uh, prosecution witness number one. And uh, happily ever after to a prosecutor means success as a prosecutor. Um, uh, not just at the end of the prosecution's case, um, where of course your, your, your success is uh, to have the defense call. And even uh, after that, um, after the defense and uh, the judge does not accept the defense and um, your case has been held to be proven right up to the end of the defense beyond reasonable doubt. Uh, that is the happy ending as far as a prosecutor is concerned. As a senior federal counsel dealing with civil cases, again, in any uh, litigation case, it's almost like, again, telling a story. So it's best to start with basics. If you are talking about a breach of an agreement, surely the first thing to do is to talk about the agreement itself. But many times I see people jumping in the deep end, calling witnesses who are least material first, and then uh, getting the whole timetable all screwed up and uh, uh, inconsistent. It becomes very difficult to follow the story. And, and uh, you know, judges being human beings, people uh, do get impatient. Uh, so my advice is to anyone who's listening in is that um, there's no shortcut to uh, good preparation. You must know your facts. You must know your uh, case story and uh, the storyline. 
and mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, it's not just uh, it's just not uh, telling a nursery story, but you are dealing with the law. So knowledge of the law, application of the law is very important. Yeah? So knowledge of facts is one, knowledge of the law is the other. And it's often been said that if you get your facts in order, the law will follow. Yeah. So as a lawyer, if you are um, doing criminal work, of course, uh, you will be up against the DPT. And your job is, of course, to keep on casting doubts on the prosecution's case, to make holes in the prosecution's case so that you will get the benefit of the doubt, right? Because the case, the prosecution must prove a case beyond reasonable doubt, not beyond absolute doubt or beyond a shadow of doubt. That's not the law. The law is beyond a reasonable doubt. So what is reasonable is very much a matter of interpretation by the court. So you, as a defense counsel in a criminal case, your job, you are incumbent to uh, make holes in the prosecution's case and to show what is, uh, uh, may have been this or may have been that. There could be more than one interpretation to the set of facts. And that's how you get the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, I think that's the biggest uh, difference. Okay, so, you know, we talked about your so life as a lawyer in, and as well as the judicial legal service. But I think, you know, perhaps we can now move on to sort of everyone knows you know, more for as, you know, as a judge, as a justice. Um, can I ask what sort of prompted you to be part of the judiciary and how did it came to you in the first place? Oh, you, you're asking me to go back in his, into history. Um, okay, I was called to the Malaysian Bar in 1972, uh, practiced for a year before uh, spending 12 years in the service. I left in 85 and I practiced as a defense counsel, as a, a civil litigator for a good 25 years. Then in 2009, the then Chief Justice uh, asked me whether I would be interested to uh, join the bench as a JC, uh, Judicial Commissioner. And um, so after 25 years practice and 12 years in service, I thought, hmm, I, uh, it's about time that I have another change in my career. So I said yes uh, to the Chief Justice and then uh, agreed to uh, join the bench as a Judicial Commissioner. Uh, sitting as a JC, I was in the uh, NCBC, New uh, Commercial Court Division. There was something new that was being introduced by uh, Chief Justice uh, Tunzaki at that time. We had new courts known as the uh, new uh, civil courts and the new uh, commercial courts. And uh, I was in uh, the commercial court. We were working on a, almost like a buddy system. Uh, two, judge, mm. you know, two judges uh, were working together. My um, buddy judge was the former speaker of uh, parliament, Tan Sri uh, Arif uh, Yusuf. Oh, wow. And uh, we were doing similar cases. And uh, what happened was that uh, if uh, there was a case that uh, I had to be recused or uh, uh, not available to do that, we would do a swap of the cases. So this went on very um, uh, smoothly because many cases would come up for mediation, for example. And if the mediation was not successful, you, we should not also be the trial judge. So we would change or swap the cases. Um, so that went on for a good uh, two years. And then um, in 2012, I was uh, uh, elevated to the Court of Appeal. In, in, as a JC and as a High Court judge, I did not do many. Uh, I probably did one or two criminal cases as a relief, relief judge, but not uh, in the main. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, when I went to the uh, Court of Appeal, uh, we dealt with um, many uh, civil as well as uh, criminal cases. Again, I sat many times with uh, Dantri Arif uh, Yusuf. I also sat many times with uh, Hamid Sultan, Justice Hamid Sultan, and of wow. course, so many other uh, judges. And uh, there are some criminal cases which I recall uh, we, we, we did, although we were mainly doing civil cases, but uh, we dealt with this uh, criminal appeals. Uh, one was the uh, case of uh, Teo Bing Hock, a man who fell to his death uh, in the MACC building. Oh. Uh, the court had uh, held, uh, arrived at an open verdict. The uh, Royal Commission of Inquiry uh, held that uh, Teo Bing Hock was driven to suicide, whatever that meant. And, uh, but on appeal, 
to the Court of Appeal. Um, and this this was the um, final court because uh, from the Sessions Court, the appeal was to the High Court. The High Court judge actually upheld the Sessions finding of an open verdict. But when it came up on the appeal to uh, the Court of Appeal, we reversed that. And uh, we disagreed with that, find, with that verdict. We disagreed with what the RCI had said. And we held, uh, we came to a finding um, and held uh, the MACC officers largely responsible. So that was one case I recall. Another case, of course, we dealt with uh, Nick Nazmi's case. I don't know whether you recall this. This case uh, deals with Section 9, uh, Subsection 5 of the Peaceful Assembly Act. And um, that section, Section 9.5, uh, calls uh, or provides for organizers of a assembly, which has to be a peaceful assembly without bearing arms, peaceful assembly without violence. Uh, organizers must give uh, notice to the police. And um, I recall it has to be at least uh, five days, 10 days, something like that. Mm, okay. And um, so Nick Nazmi uh, was the organizer in one rallies he did not give uh, notice but he was charged and on appeal uh, we held uh, that uh, having to give notice for a, an assembly under PAA was unconstitutional and uh, we struck it down it was the same panel I remember we I sat with uh, chairman was that uh, Tan Sri Arif and uh, together with uh, Hamid Sultan myself we struck it down as being unconstitutional but having said that um, sometime later, I think within a year or two, there was another case, similar facts, that uh, came up on appeal in the Court of Appeal. And the then President of the Court of Appeal, Tony Lau, he uh, actually sat in the Court of Appeal, presided in that case. And um, on a similar point, went the other way around and uh, said it was uh, constitutional. So the matter has ended there. So we have now got two cases on Section 95. One says not constitutional, one says constitutional. And um, to my knowledge, I don't think uh, there has been a case that has gone up to the federal court um, to say one way or the other. Um, yes, and then of course there were cases on you know, the MPH bookstore. One of the um, staff were selling books which were banned. Oh. And they were not. <laughs> but the irony of that case was that uh, they were arrested and uh, uh, are said to be selling or distributing unlawful uh, publications even before the ban took effect. So, of course, that was not as close to the Um Yes, and of course, there were many, many other uh, cases that we dealt with in the, uh, in the criminal division. And of course, in the civil division, uh, as you know, it's a volume of cases that really is a challenge. Not so much the individual. <laughs> the difficulty is not in the individual cases. The law is not insurmountable, provided you read the bundles and you read the readings and everything else and you read the law. It's not insurmountable. A lot of reading. There's a lot of reading to be done. But I think what every judge will tell you is that the big challenge is the number of uh, cases you have to deal with, the volume of cases. And uh, if it was true way back when I was in service, uh, and the bench area for 2015, I think it's even truer now in the sense that uh, of course deal with a lot of cases. And of course, then now with COVID and online hearings, uh, things mm -hmm. get so disrupted. Um, it's not that uh, you know, smooth sailing, I would say. Yeah. The other challenge, of course, is that um, whether you are sitting as a trial judge or sitting as an appellate judge, uh, is that um, you have to be prepared to make a decision as soon as the case is uh, uh, closed, uh, you should not delay too long for a decision to be made. And once you do that, parties are at, uh, at liberty. They have a right to appeal. And if they do appeal within that one month after the decision, a judge has only eight weeks to write his grounds of judgment. So when you have uh, case after case after case that you are uh, disposing on a regular basis, that is provided, you know, you, any uh, hardworking judge will get through his uh, work list uh, in an effective manner. The number of uh, appeals uh, can pile up, and you have only eight weeks to do that. So any trial judge will tell you there are no free week evenings 
weekday evenings, and definitely no free weekends as well. A lot of time is uh, spent uh, writing that. And this goes right up to the appeal courts uh, because uh, similarly, well, even though while there may be three judges uh, hearing the cases, um, but everybody takes turns to write. Yeah? Uh, the chairman will allocate the uh, cases to himself or to the right winger and the left winger. So, you know, you, you have this large number of cases. And again, the eight weeks uh, apply. And uh, it's very important that you clear your uh, backlog because if you don't, and it comes to time for promotion and the large number of uh, cases uh, in arrears, that will work against the record. It, it will be against you. And, and wow. uh, this is one of the criteria uh, that is uh, for promotion, and that is you must have a clean record. You must clear the backlog of cases. Of course, if it's an ongoing case, a couple of cases uh, at any one time, that is acceptable. But if you have 30, 40 cases of 10, <laughs> That is not acceptable. Okay, you know, on, on that point, you know, uh, I'd just like to ask you, like, you know, because you were once a, a counsel, but then you move on to the judiciary. Do you see in any aspects where um, that being a lawyer helped you in becoming a judge? For example, if case if something can, could be dealt within five minutes, you call that person first, then you move on to the ones that take longer. Is there any aspect of like, you know, that from your experience as a lawyer that helped you become a sort of almost a, a better judge. Would you say that? I would say so, yes, definitely, uh, Samuel, in that uh, as a uh, practitioner, as a trial practitioner, um, you get to know what the bench expects. Yeah? You will have the feel, a very good feel of uh, what judges uh, want to hear, want to know. And so you tailor your case, you tailor the uh, facts of the case and get the law to support you on your facts and to present it in a way which is, as I mentioned just now, in a, in a most easy to follow manner, chronologically and uh, factually. Because a judge is only human. His attention span is probably shorter than the lawyers. Uh, lawyers have to be on their feet and make sure that everything he has prepared is uh, delivered. That is, judges can switch off. You know, if you start rambling and mumbling, you cannot be heard clearly and uh, uh, you do not make it interesting enough, judges can switch off. And that is a terrible thing that can happen to uh, the lawyer's case. So with that kind of experience, when I was sitting as a judge, I was very mindful of um, getting on with the case as efficiently as possible and uh, to make sure that lawyers have the opportunity to present the best points first. You, you know, sometimes lawyers tend to have 20, 30 points ready for argument. But uh, judges will just say, look, get to your killer points first. What is the most important point? And uh, very often, and many judges over the years have always said, you know, if you have got the main killer points established, you'll probably win the case uh, without having to go into uh, 15 grounds or 20 grounds. Because by the time you go to ground number 20, the judge has forgotten what ground number one was. They're all human. So, yeah, so um, people look at different things yeah? and, and, and treat different things uh, differently. All right. So, Dato Ma, with that being said, is there anything that you wish you had known about the judiciary before you became a judge? <laughs> I always say, uh, Elaine, that uh, I never worked so hard until I joined the bench. Why? Because as a lawyer and as one got more senior, uh, at the bar, a lot of the work is repetitious. A lot of the, you know, a, a drug case is a drug case, for example. Uh, of course, the facts vary, but the principles of law are about the same. Uh, an agreement is an agreement, that kind of thing. And uh, as you get more senior and you have your LAs and your pupils to assist you, so they do all the groundwork and the lawyer gets the case together and presents the uh, case in argument. That's the easy part. Presenting a case while you are, I'm a lazy fellow, so uh, uh, get all the work done and uh, uh, just present the case. Uh, and that, that's just um, uh, much easier than the getting up. Yeah, the getting up getting up here means getting your case ready, whether it's a criminal case or a uh, civil case. And uh, depends on how thorough you are, how painstaking you are, uh, that will be the kind of getting up that you uh, put in. 
So as a practitioner, you have people to assist you. That's the easy part. But sitting on the, uh, on the bench as a judge, yes, you have a registrar. But the registrars that we have spend a lot of their precious time doing administrative work. We don't have law researchers, even in the court of appeal, very, unless you're very senior, of course, at CJ and the top of top four judges, they have their researchers. But by and large, the uh, court of appeal judges and the federal court judges do not have their researchers. They have registrars, but the registrars do more than just doing research. So, you know, the time is split. So how much can you expect from a registrar? Um, and, and, you know, they have to do the case list. They have to uh, look after so many of the administrative uh, issues. So uh, it'd really be good if um, judges can have access to just good research offices to do uh, research on the law to assist them. And, uh, of course, uh, you would have heard that a judgment is only as good as the submissions made by counsel. Right. So uh, if you get counsels who uh, are not well prepared and submissions are not well prepared, well, you can't really fault the judge because the judge won't have much time to do his own research other than you know, relying on his own basic uh, knowledge of the law. Um, Dato Ma, with all of the interesting cases that you've mentioned um, just now, is there a case which you've found most memorable till this day as a judge? and that you also find to be one of your best judgments? Gosh, there have been so many. Um, you know, I don't, can't particularly single out any of these uh, important cases. But I can do, I, I can mention this, that when I retired from the Court of Appeal and as a federal president, the um, editorial board of the, of, we have the Malaysian, uh, the court of its own publication, the journal and so on. And the editorial board, um, they do this for all, all judges who are retiring. And that is to compile uh, the more important cases. And uh, so I had a, a compilation of, uh, of my own uh, judgment, uh, the more important ones. And I thought that was a very um, fitting uh, farewell gift um, to be reminded of what the important judgments are, rather than getting a pewter plug or a, <laughs> or a neck pie or something, you know. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't know, so many cases which uh, are, are of uh, equal importance. But at the end of it, um, uh, whether as a practitioner or as a trial judge or as a appellate judge, there are certain principles which are ingrained into a person, and that is a sense of justice, a sense of natural justice, a sense of doing the right thing and to make sure there's fair play. Whether you are a practitioner or not, you want to see fair play in court. And of mm. course, if you win a case, fine. And if you lose a case for good reason, you have to accept it. Similarly in court, uh, as a judge, uh, you have to be fair. There's no room for bias, no room for any prejudices, racial or religious or uh, ethnic, ethnic uh, there should be no ethnic considerations of any sort. You just look at the uh, cold letter of the uh, text and uh, cold, the cold print, so to speak, and uh, you consider the uh, law. And so whether it's an important case, a not so important case, whether it's in the millions or in the thousands, or you know, whether there are personalities involved and so on, all that will count for not if the basic principles are not observed. Yes. And uh, my parting advice to all young lawyers is to think and say, look, you're not just doing, uh, it's just not just a job, you know, practicing law, whether as a uh, practitioner or in court, uh, sitting on the bench, it's not just a job. It is a vocation. It's a journey uh, where uh, you will find yourself in a position to do something right. Mm. To, you know, maybe in a very small way to dispense with some justice. And if you see something has been wrong, somebody has been wrong, and sitting as a judge, uh, you can correct it. Or sitting on appeal, you can correct uh, what is uh, uh, error, error in law or a wrong finding of fact and so on. It is a very important job and and that uh, those principles 
prevails. It goes through all the cases that uh, one handles, you know. So um, I think when you ask me which are the important cases, you're asking me which are the more dramatic ones, which are the <laughs> ones where personalities are involved. Well, to me, every case is important. <laughs> well, I, some of our listeners were hoping, uh, I think they were hoping that you name some so that, you know, they'll, after hearing the podcast, they'll immediately go research your, your most uh, dramatic cases. <laughs> uh, in just uh, the, some of the more dramatic ones need not necessarily be reported. Oh. Yeah, and again, in those uh, early days, we didn't have as many law journals as now. And uh, it was before the digital age, so everything was in writing and any reporting would have been done in print. Whereas today, you can have a decision and uh, immediately it will be reported uh, social media and, and so on. So things have uh, changed quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Ma, just now you mentioned about, you know, being a judge, how you're required to be independent and, you know, justice being the justice being the main factor. Do you felt that because, you know, you were a judge, you know, and, you know, you do not take into account it of everything but of the law and, and issues, do you felt that um, ethically, not only as a judge, but also as a person, you sort of became a better person of it that, you know, no matter what this person who or what he did, you still, you know, just listen to what the council had to say? Oh, before that, let me add, apart from following the rules of natural justice, uh, apart from making sure there's no biasness and no uh, prejudices, one very, very, in fact, in today's context, I would say this is uh, right at the top of any judge's uh, mind, any mindset and any attitude towards uh, work as a judge is to be 100% clean, 100% anti-corruption. You know, a judge must not beyond absolute doubt, not just a shadow of doubt or beyond reasonable doubt, beyond absolute doubt there must be no suggestions of any corruption because mm -hmm. um, any judge who is worth the salt should not succumb to corruption and, and if he is really after money, he should uh, resign and come out to practice, the sky is the limit. But if you know that uh, you want to remain as a judge, you know your salary is limited. A judge today earns about 40,000 ringgit plus, plus the perks, a free car, free petrol, telephone, that kind of thing, all added up 40, 40,000 plus, which is, um, if you compare to a successful practitioner, that's really very small compared. I mean, you have heard of uh, lawyers making uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, per month, a few million dollars a year. Not difficult, not difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, an opinion by a senior uh, practitioner, you can easily cost 80,000, 100,000, money up front before the work is done. But wow. um, judges have to sit and write so many judgments just to earn the 40, 50,000 ringgit. Um, so you cannot join the judiciary with a view of making money. You have joined the wrong place, you've gone to the wrong place. Uh. Uh, and, and uh, so it has to be something over and above monetary considerations. And that's where the ideals come into play, the principles come into play, because there's no price for integrity. You wow. can't put a number to integrity. You can't put a cost value to uh, transparency and, uh, and being intellectually honest. That's the other issue that I want to talk about. It's not just honesty in the terms of dollars and cents, in terms of not uh, doing favors for friends and relatives, that kind of uh, uh, honesty or dishonesty is well known. But there's also another aspect, and it affects not only judges, also all practitioners. There's a concept of intellectual honesty or intellectual dishonesty. Why do I say this? Because nothing in life is black and white. Mm. The law is never black and white. That's why you need lawyers, because we've got different shades of gray. Yes. Many shades of grey, and that's where you need interpretation of those shades of grey. So, depending on how persuasive the argument is, but depending on how you know cohesive your whole argument is, that um, eventually the judge will uh, make a decision and decide on the shade of grey that you are uh, canvassing, right? But we also know that with intellectual 
a human uh, and people who are very articulate and have a play of words and um, <laughs> and and uh, turn something which is light gray into dark gray not maybe not from black to white or white to black but you know you want to try and say there's this spectrum of um, of thought that uh, one can use your intellect to tweak the facts a little perhaps and still come within uh, the concept of uh, oh I exercise my discretion to decide mm -hmm. this one. but at the end of the day was there intellectual honesty in, in that you know? wow yeah, uh, it, it's a very interesting. Uh, I can spend another hour talking to you about that. But, uh, suffice to just say that that is as important as being non-corruptible. Um, you know, on that point, Dato, uh, I would just like to ask. You know, you mentioned how judges, you know, they have, you, you mentioned yourself, they have no weekends. You know, the money as compared to a private practitioner, they earn less. They spend their weekends writing judgments, but you know. From your point of view, um, did you not just on those points, but did you find it uh, quite hard to be a justice? You know, because they, you know you have perhaps uh, you have to be seen as independent. Do you manage? You know, and everybody's mind. Did do, does a judge manage to have a, a social life to say? You know, did, because you know when you go out and say, oh, he's a judge, and then you know you can't wow. favor anybody. Well, yes, definitely, uh, Samuel. The moment uh, somebody. Uh, appointed a judge his lifestyle changes quite substantially and uh, gone are the evenings where you can go and have a drink with your friends uh, and and uh, you know uh, socialize uh, freely and so on but i think there are restrictions uh, and the judge's code of ethics applies and there are a lot of constraints uh, in that code but having said that it doesn't mean to say a judge must be a hermit uh, no, and neither does the uh, mean to say uh, a judge must throw away all his short pants and must only wear long pants. No, <laughs> I continue to wear my short pants uh, and go for a day tarik around my favorite uh, mama shop uh, with some very good friends. Uh, mm -hmm. But a very clear line must be drawn, and that is you cannot be socializing with people who are. Uh, lawyers, active law lawyers, active in practice, and who are appearing before you, uh, or you have relatives who have you know, who want to ask you favors um, in, in their cases and so on. That is a no no. So no mm -hmm. way can you socialize with lawyers who are appearing before the judge or, uh, or family members who have um, uh, hidden agendas, you know. But to uh, have a tete tete with friends or classmates whom. Are as uh, crazy as you are for years and years. You don't just <laughs> say, "Look, uh, I can't talk to you anymore." But uh, you just have to be a little more careful, a little more discreet. But um, that didn't stop me from wearing my short pants and <laughs> you have a, a good day, Tari. You know, um, and that, that's also important because you need to have some other avenue. Uh, and at the same time, you are actually having your ear to the ground. You hear what is happening. Uh, you hear from friends. Uh, what's happening around you and they will tell you and say look uh, you know this is what public opinion is like and so on something other than what you read in the papers or wow. social media so that that's also quite uh, important um yes you do have a social life but not as freely as uh, before and for the for the reasons i i mentioned but at the same time i think uh, to keep sane uh, a judge <laughs> <laughs> like any other person like a lawyer should have Something to do other than law. Have a hobby. Ah. Have a hobby. And I keep saying this uh, in many of my talks to young lawyers and family students. I always say, look, have a hobby. Whatever it is, whether it's ballroom dancing, go wow. to Kondo, or the good old-fashioned hobbies of collecting stamps. Nobody collects stamps or coins anymore, as far as I know. <laughs> but some motorsports, drifting, or something like that. Something ah. really current. So have a hobby because it's important to take your mind off work and have uh, you know something non-legal so that after the weekend you are physically recharged mentally recharged and uh, ready to go um, and for myself i have a little farm in uh, rawang oh wow uh, so i keep uh, some goats i have uh, <laughs> uh, a pair of cows 
<laughs> and you know, with the usual poultry and so on. So I connect with nature in that way. Wow. Uh, in the sense that um, nobody comes and asks for an opinion or nobody <laughs> for law uh, when I'm on the farm. And it, it's all very peaceful. So uh, yeah, very, very stress-free. So something like that, everybody should have some, some distraction. Wow. wow. You know, just a, just a very short question on that. Just now um, you mentioned that, uh, you know, how judges must be, be independent and they shouldn't mingle around um, active lawyers who are in practice. Would you say that because of that, um, more of your closer friends were your fellow judges, you're the judiciary? Not necessarily. Judges will, yeah, we probably meet up uh, as and when there are uh, gatherings like weddings and, you know, um, days of open houses, open house, whether it is, you know, New Year and Hari Raya and all that. Yeah, but no, it's not a case of uh, judges uh, meeting up uh, and, and socializing just because they don't socialize with uh, practitioners. You know, judges, uh, I think, by and large, are very much keep to themselves. Oh, okay, okay. So now, uh, Dr. Ma, we just we are coming sort of uh, to the end of the podcast. Mm. Now it's just sort of like a, you know, general questions that uh, we prepared. Uh, so the firstly, could you just like tell, you know, some just very short or brief tips how to prepare for like a effective uh, appellate trial? Some of your just short tips on it. Appeal in the high court or? Uh, a- uh, appeals in high court from the court of appeal to federal court you know that, that pallet work that mm-hmm. okay let's say uh, there are two types of um, work that one can undertake one is where you are the lawyer handling the case uh, at trial and uh, you also handle the appeal uh, so you have a good knowledge of what has been said in the uh, trial court and then you you know you follow up on that um, the other type of uh, case would be where you just come in, just been retained to do the appeal. Um, well, I would uh, definitely say that uh, whether uh, you are following through a case from the uh, trial court or um, just for the appeal, um, you have to get a grip of the facts of the case um, and, and uh, of course, to understand what was uh, said or what was not said uh, during trial, and it's very important to uh, um, get the grounds of judgment, which uh, would be written by the judge once there's an appeal. Remember, uh, eight weeks the judge will deliver, and uh, to analyze and to dissect the uh, judgment very carefully, and to draft your grounds of appeal, the memorandum of appeal. Yeah, that's very important because you are then bound by your uh, grounds, bound by your memo. The four corners will be your guiding um, guiding light when you go for appeal. Because the moment you go beyond the four corners, the other side is going to object and say, look, this is not one of your grounds of appeal. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it will be a difficult uh, job to try to uh, uh, canvas uh, the point not uh, permitted on. The other, of course, is that um, it has to be evidence uh, already led in the trial court. Because if you want to bring in fresh evidence, you have to make a separate application for uh, fresh evidence to be uh, uh, admitted in appeal. And the principles of Marshall and Lead will apply in that, uh, you know, you were, were you du- duly uh, diligent uh, in discovering the fresh evidence? Was it available? Uh, and how would it uh, impact the result of the appeal? So you have a few more obstacles to overcome if you want to uh, refer to fresh evidence. Yeah, so groundwork is very important. On appeal, when you are uh, handling the case, uh, you have to be, uh, of course, articulate and to uh, address the uh, court on the main point, the killer points, which I referred to. Uh, And uh, don't go on a long roundabout way to try to explain a point. Uh, Some judges will, at least there was one judge who was very fond of saying, don't take me to Timbuktu. <laughs> Be far away. Come to the point straight away. Um, or uh, one very important point not uh, to, to observe and not to do is to read from your submissions. Mm-hmm. You know, yes, you may have written out your submissions. Uh, you have your appeal record. 
and uh, tendency of younger lawyers is to actually read out what they have written. It's very boring. There's no emphasis on the points that you want to raise. And the judge will probably react and say, look, the last time I had a reading lesson when I was in standard two, so don't take me back there. You know, so uh, better in mind, don't read your submissions. It's better. It's better if you have uh, uh, points, bullet points of your argument. And that's what I used to do uh, under topics, headings, bullet points um. and, uh, or trigger points. And um, as you are on your feet and you uh, develop your argument, you just follow these points. And because you are well-versed with the case, the narrative will follow. And this is very important. Why? Because if you're reading from a script, don't forget, uh, if you, especially if you are, let's say, in the Court of Appeal, there are three judges, mm -hmm. and you do not know which judge is going to shoot a question at you, right? Um, you might be in the middle of a sentence and a question is uh, thrown at you, and you must be able to reply. An advocate should never say, I will come back later and answer your question. Or let me finish this paragraph. I'll, I will address your question or I address your concerns later. You shouldn't be doing that. That is not good uh, appellate advocacy. A question is asked. That means something is troubling that judge at that time. And the, the lawyer must or should respond to that point immediately to clear any doubts. Uh -huh. So if you are reading and reading, questions are thrown in you, you are going to be thrown off your, uh, your script. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'll find it very hard to come back to it and so on. Whereas, if you are submitting on uh, points, uh, following your bullet points, it's so much easier to divert, answer some questions, and then come back to your uh, bullet points to develop your argument. With that being said, uh, Datoma, mm. uh, like how you've mentioned, you know, lawyers have so many arguments uh, here and there. I'm sure among uh, all the cases they handle, there are many difficult points of law, difficult areas. So as for you, what was your go-to approach to these difficult points of law or are there any tips that you can share as like how you overcame that? If you have difficult points of uh, law, I think um, the safest way is to do research. And um, unless it's a very novel point of law, completely new, completely unheard of, no arguments, no decisions before, then you are very much on your own uh, as a judge and you will rely heavily on the submissions uh, before you. But luckily, with uh, good law reporting these days, uh, any judge will be able to find precedence. And so with a bit of research, a bit of uh, checking, you will be able to find out what uh, previous judges have uh, decided or how they have ruled on this uh, particular point. So, uh, as I say, unless it's something totally novel, uh, unheard of, uh, then, of course, that calls for uh, greater uh, research. But other than that, uh, you will always have the uh, precedence to uh, guide you. Oh, okay. So, from being a former lawyer and a former judge as well, what recommendations do you have in terms of, you know, trying to handle better and trying to improve case management? Case management is uh, important, uh, not just for uh, the registrars and how they manage the cases, the timeline and so on, but it's also important for the parties, both civil and uh, criminal cases, um, to, to um, have a handle of the case even before it starts, so that uh, you will be able to see, you know, take an overall uh, view of the case and uh, see what the timelines are. And um, that will tell you what you have to do to uh, in preparation of the case, because preparation is a very important uh, aspect of uh, practice. In fact, uh, there are only three words to make a, to become a good lawyer. And that is preparation, preparation, preparation. <laughs> you can never be over prepared, but you can always be under prepared. So with good preparation, uh, you are ready when it comes to case management, whether in terms of the number of witnesses, uh, in terms of uh, uh, how much time you need and so on. So you are in a position to help the court and say, look, I, I'll be calling three witnesses. I'll probably need one day, two days. 
to call the witnesses, or if it's an appeal, I'll probably need uh, half an hour, one hour, that kind of thing. You are in better control. With case management, you are in better control of what uh, you're doing. Yeah. All right, so uh, moving on, would you like to share with us a little bit about your life after the judiciary, after such a long and amazing career that you've had? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Elaine, for that question. Uh, well, I retired uh, from the courts uh, in uh, February 2015. And um, that seems a long time ago. That's because uh, judges have to retire at the age of 66. Civil servants retire at the age of 60, but uh, judges go on to 66. But still, I think 66 is a young age for retirement. And I always say, well, when you touch that age, you reach the age of uh, statutory senility because by law, you're deemed to be senile at uh, retirement age and therefore you have to step down. But uh, no, no, I think it's just a number. And um, I have been doing quite a bit since uh, 2015 uh, after my retirement. Um, just a quick uh, uptake on that is that um, I was appointed a uh, director of the board of directors of uh, Asunta Hospital, which I'm sure you have heard of. It is a charitable hospital in Patalin Jaya. And of course, this is um, a pro bono work, charity work. And I've been a director of the hospital since uh, 2016 till now. And um, then of course, uh, in 2016, I was uh, appointed a commissioner of uh, Soha Kam, which is the National Human Rights uh, Institute. And the first term was for three years, and um, it was um, renewed in 2019 and finished my second term in April this year. So I have finished uh, my term of six years. That's the maximum provided by the, uh, allowable by the Sohakam Act. Um, and um, I was also appointed a um, commissioner with MAFCOM. MAFCOM is the uh, Malaysian uh, Civil Aviation Commission. And this is a regulatory body that uh, issues licenses and uh, looks after all uh, airlines and passengers who are flying, you know, Mars, Asia, X, Asia, and so on, and all the uh, Malaysian registered airlines. And um, so we are the regulatory body. And, and uh, we also look after the uh, airports. I mean, we here, meaning, of course, MAFCOM looks after the airport. I too have finished my uh, term there after uh, two terms. I finished um, in, um, in February this year, earlier this year. Um, yes, I was also on the JEC, Judicial Appointments Commission, which I'm sure you are familiar with. Um, I was there for two years, um, um, 2018 until uh, 2020. Um, and then, of course, there was a change of government and there was a change of... Uh, commissioners on the JAC. JAC is the body that um, selects judges for the superior courts. That means starting as JCs. The JAC also um, looks into the promotion of uh, judges, confirmation of judges from, J from judicial commissioner to uh, being a judge of the high court, promotions from court of appeal, um, high court, court of appeal, and then on to the federal court. Um, yeah, so I, I finished that as well. And um, currently I'm chairman of uh, CIDREC. CIDREC stands for Securities Industry Dispute Resolution Center. It's a company limited by guarantee um, and it is a company under the Securities Commission. Yeah, it's one of the companies under the SC. And the uh, mandate of uh, CIDREC is to um, try to resolve uh, complaints or claims made by uh, investors in the capital market. So let's say you want to buy shares, uh, you're not happy with the um, information given to you by your remise and there's some, you know, some, some losses and you want to complain against the members, then of course you come to CDRAC and we try to resolve the matter through mediation. And if that's not successful, then through education. Um, we have also been um, authorized by the courts now uh, through a practice direction that was issued by the Chief Justice um, a couple of months ago to have court-referred cases 
too syndrag for mediation. So this is a situation where uh, people have filed a claim in the high court, for example, or in a sessions court, and uh, they reckon uh, through consent and through agreement that they reckon that the uh, case may be settled through mediation. So they come to uh, SIDRAC and we have a panel of uh, mediators. So um, through, after case management, a mediator will be appointed to try to resolve the case so that it does not have to go through litigation in court. So apart from all those appointments, I um, am busy uh, sitting as an arbitrator. Um, I'm on a panel with uh, AIAC, that's the Asian International Arbitration Center, which I'm sure many of you, when you practice, will get involved with. Like, for example, Tan Sri David Wong and I, we are uh, arbitrators, and uh, quite often we uh, sit together as a panel of three, what they call a tribunal of arbitrators. Um, here, so here, these are cases which uh, are, are by consent, by agreement between parties, that they come uh, to have a case, the case is referred to, uh, to an arbitrator, so the matter can be resolved uh, through arbitration without uh, having to go through the legal process in court. So um, yeah, these are the few things that I have been up to since my retirement until now. Oh, Dato, it seems that you're still as active as you are <laughs> even after being in the judiciary. Well, I have finished the official part of the uh, uh, work in the sense that um, uh, there's a lot of public interest and uh, national interest even in the uh, work carried out by SOACOM, MAFCOM, and the JAC. Uh, even in SIDREC, I would say there is an element of uh, public interest in it. So um, this, this calls for um, some, some uh, time and effort uh, to be put in. Um, but of course, uh, sitting as arbitrator, that's very much uh, um, on my own in the sense that I, I, I say as arbitrator, there's no, uh, I mean, there's, it's not public office. Yeah, it's not public office. The others are. And at the same time, I also uh, uh, am a consultant, a legal consultant in my firm. Although I don't run it, my son Raymond runs it. I'm just a consultant. And uh, I go in as and when there's a need. So if they don't want to talk to me, then I don't have to go in. All right. Thank you so much, Dato. Oh, Thank you. Yeah. So coming to you know the sort of the ending of uh, the podcast, and to end it on a high note, I would like to ask you, Dato Ma, do you have any words of advice or encouragement for all the upcoming lawyers and pupils out there? Yes, most certainly. Law is a honorable profession has been said many, many times. And um, there's a lot of uh, reasons and basis for that statement. It is not just a job, as I mentioned just now. It is a vocation and uh, a lifetime journey. Like they say, you know, uh, lawyers and judges never die. We only lose our appeal. <laughs> um, but um, Importantly, is that uh, to be able to know to know that you are able to make a difference, um, no matter how small it is. I think that is something uh, that ought to be uh, cherished. And um, please don't just think of making money. It's not. It's not. Money will come. Of course, I know. As a young lawyer, you need to uh, earn enough to pay for your rent you need to pay enough for your mm -hmm. uh, transport your car social life dinners and so on even a day tarik costs two dollars fifty cents this day the money is so small mm -hmm. thing the food the prices are so high so yes you need to earn a decent wage a decent salary to uh, get by but um, don't be in such a hurry and more importantly is that don't do things which should not be done simply because you want to make that extra ringgit fast. Uh, that is going down a slippery uh, slope. Um, and because, um, you know, if you follow the rules and regulations set by the Bar Council, uh, there are many do's and don'ts. And uh, one of them, of course, is uh, honesty. Um, 
you can overcharge uh, clients. Most certainly, you cannot uh, put your finger in the till and, and use clients' money and so on. Because if you do that, there are consequences. It's illegal, and uh, you will be pulled up before the disciplinary board, and you can be struck off the roll. So can you imagine a lot, somebody who has done four years of law, chambering, got a PC, practicing, and then he becomes a little greedy and uses a client's money. Right, mm. He's caught out, and uh, the board decides to uh, strike him off the rolls. All that will be lost in a jiffy. So, um, yeah, don't, 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 uh, in short, I'm saying is uh, don't be so greedy, don't be greedy, don't be so money minded that you will do the wrong things just to make a quick buck. Mm. Be patient, and uh, once you establish yourself in what you're doing, people will come to you and people will pay the fees that you want them to pay. Mm. Very wise words. <laughs> but some of these are. Be uh, easier said than that. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, so I've gone through a life as a young lawyer, life as a practitioner, life as a judge. Um, yes, there are challenges at every turn. Oh. So, you know, uh, other than that, is there anything else would you like to say to our listeners and viewers out there, Datoma? To many lawyers, the crowning glory, so to speak, is to be a judge, mm. right? And uh, so, yeah, many people are mindful of this. In fact, it doesn't take much to be a judge. All you have to be will be a practitioner of at least 10 years standing. And uh, legally, you are eligible to be appointed as a judge. And according to our system, you get appointed as a JC, uh, JC first. And mm. um, so it is not beyond uh, you know uh, somebody's planning to say look i plan to be a judge um, and you work towards that and 10 years of practice you are eligible but in reality i think most of the judges who are appointed always have at least 25 30 years of mm. uh, practice or has work in the services to uh, uh, behind them you know it's much much more than just 10 years Ten years is still a very short time. I see, I see. Yeah. First, if I may just end on this note, remember I was uh, uh, suggesting or, or, or advising that uh, after you pass your exams and you, uh, you, know, you get your degree and then after your call, you need not necessarily uh, practice if you don't want to. Um, and, and you can go into you know, being in-house or uh, in-house advisor, in-house counsel, or you can be an academic and or join the judicial and legal service. So these are all uh, various options. And uh, if you are into uh, litigation, uh, think about mediation and arbitration. That too uh, is the flavor of the month, so to speak, because a lot more uh, mediation cases are, you know, are being uh, held. Uh, and, and you'll find that in many of the agreements, especially in the construction uh, agreements in the construction and building industry, it is very common to have a clause in an agreement to say that if there's a dispute, uh, the matter should be referred to either mediation or if that doesn't work, then to uh, arbitration. Yeah, so these are um, growth areas in terms of legal practice. Okay, think about that. Okay. All right. Yes, we sure will think about that. Thank you so much, Datoma, for. Um, sharing with us you know okay. about all these extra uh, tips thank you so much Dr. Paul. thank you so I much mean, Dr. Paul. Yes, really appreciate you. Okay. well thank you for having me thanks for inviting it has been very uh, refreshing to uh, talk about um, uh, so many of the topics that we touched on this evening um, yeah you have given me an opportunity to go down memory lane <laughs> Well, I, that's all the time that we have with Dr. Ma. Thank you for listening to Alibi, the podcast. We hope that uh, all of you out there uh, enjoyed the very first episode with the special series with former judge. Thank you so much, Dr. Ma, for joining us, you know, for sharing your incredible journey in chambers all the way to the judiciary. I'm sure all of us, you know, uh, really appreciate your words of wisdom and knowledge. Uh, 
and until then do stay up there until our social media pages and see you in the next episode sorry now that i'm a little late i apologize that you had to wait Totally slipped my mind I lost all my sense of time So buy me that drink and just let me think And I'll tell you the reasons why